change your life. Yes, amen. Amen. It, it doesn't matter what you are involved in. It doesn't matter how deep a person is um, lost, how deep a person is addicted, depressed. An encounter with Jesus is life-changing. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And as we get started, it's great to be back. I'll tell you just a little bit. As I told you all before I left, I went into the chaplain candidate program last year, and I went to officer training school with the Air Force this summer. And I'm in the reserves right now, so I'm back and I'm back teaching in Holmes County, and uh, it's been a good year so far. Uh, God's really been blessing, um, really been blessing us. But I want to begin this morning in Matthew chapter four, verse seventeen through twenty. Matthew chapter four, verse seventeen through twenty. How many of you have been changed by an encounter with Jesus? Y'all stand with me this morning as we read this, as we read the word. And we're going to look, I'm going to talk to you about three positive encounters with Jesus. One negative encounter with Jesus. And I want to ask you about your encounter with Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 through 20. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. That was pretty common in Jewish culture then. To, to, to react that way. We don't always leave everything we're doing for a living, but there's a concept here we want to talk about. Would y'all pray with me real quick? Father, we love you this morning. And God, I cannot preach this morning about an encounter with you without you being present. And I believe you're here today. But Lord, I'm asking you today to, to quicken me body, soul, and spirit, God, to be able to speak a word, Lord, that can go beyond the ears but to the heart, God. All of us this morning need to hear from God, and I pray on every level, Lord, your, your, your voice would speak to every heart in this house, Lord. God, break strongholds, Lord. Bring freedom, bring liberty, God, to every person in this place today. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You see. Here we see a model. We see... Jesus encountering Peter and his brother Andrew. I want to focus on Peter this morning. I think Peter's a good good model to look at. Give us some hope, doesn't he? Amen. Peter Amen. didn't always get it right, did he? No. he? He didn't always get it right, but he got it right. Yes, he did. By the grace of God. But here we see the model. Jesus was made real to them. You know, in our lives, Jesus is not going to physically come to everyone. <coughs> He's not, for the most part, the, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to encounter us. And the Holy Spirit is the representation of Christ in this place today. But no matter how Jesus encounters someone, how many of you know it's never accidental when the Lord encounters? Right. There are no accidental encounters. I'm, I'm a very random person sometimes. I, I forget what I'm doing. I forget why I'm doing it. Sometimes I forget to do it. <laughs> I walk into a room and I won't always remember why I walked into it. But I'll assure you this morning that Jesus will not come into this house randomly. That's right. And he'll not forget why he came. That's right. But he comes to do a work. He comes to do a work in our lives. And he came to do a work in Andrew and Peter. We see right here. I believe this morning that Jesus is going to encounter you. And he's going to give you the choice to follow him. Some of you say, well, brother, I'm already following Jesus. But are we finished following him? No, not yet. There are things God is going to call you to do that are going to require you to follow him even deeper, mm -hmm. even farther. Mm -hmm. And so it's more than that initial. It can't, start, it can't start until you initially follow him. But we see responsibility on two parts here. Jesus says, follow me. That's our part, isn't it? Amen. And he says, I will make you fishers of men. That's his part, isn't it? Aren't you thankful that all we have to do is be willing to follow Him and He'll make us something? Yes, amen. That's what I love that song. I, I, I love those songs we sang this morning. Take what's in my hand and multiply all that yes, I have. I think yes. I got that right, but if I didn't, 
You see that. Take all that I have, which is really nothing. Mm -hmm. But God can do with nothing more than we could do with everything. Yes, that's right. We yes. see two responsibilities here. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What he's calling them to is a life of repentance, to recognize the nature. You see what they're doing. He says we must leave our way and follow his way. We must realize that there is a better way. Jesus said that he would make them fishers of men. Yes, there's human action required. But there's also supernatural action required. Amen. If God doesn't make us something, we cannot be something. Would you agree with me Amen. this morning? That's right. Amen. Amen. Sometimes people ask me, how do you do what you do? I said, by the grace of God. That's right. If you talk about my mom's here, she's, she's obviously known me longer than anybody. Okay, <laughs> that goes without saying. But she remembers a much different person 12 years ago. She remembers a much different person 15, 16. She may remember a different person eight years ago. But she, she'll tell you that, that God has done a, a mighty work in my life. And there were a lot of years where I refused to follow Jesus. I refused to repent of my sin and I refused to follow Jesus. And as a result of that, I became a person that could barely do anything without falling apart. I had no internal strength. I had no mental strength. I had no, absolutely no spiritual strength whatsoever. But it was when I chose to follow Jesus that he began to make me, if I'm anything today, it's because of what he made me through my following him. And I'll tell you this, I've made more mistakes than I've probably had success stories. But here's the thing, no matter whether we fall on our face or we are absolutely uh, obedient and successful for God, how many know following him is always the right choice? Yes, amen. If you fall down, get up and follow him. Yeah, amen. If you succeed... Follow him. Amen. Amen. You see, that, that's the thing. I, I remember what is true of an encounter with Jesus is that it never leaves a person the same. God is a creator, isn't he? Yes. Amen. He, he makes things out of nothing. And as, and as he encounters us, he, he makes us. As I uh, taught uh, last week in 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 17 and 18, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and we're changed to that image from glory to glory even by the spirit of the Lord and that's that's what the spirit of God does when he encounters us he changes us into the image of Jesus I want to share a testimony as I felt was on my heart I remember how many of y'all remember if you've been saved this morning if you're not saved this morning make that decision Follow Jesus. But I remember when I first got saved. How many of y'all remember those first encounters you had with Jesus? Mm -hmm. Amen. I remember I used to go out to my dad's shed and I would sit in, I guess it was my recliner that, that the Air Force had shipped down, that TMO had shipped down some old furniture. And I used to go out there and just, that's where I would pray early on. I'd just go out there and I could just remember the atmosphere changing. And I was in the presence of God and I just remember thinking, man, this is, this was all I ever needed. You know, why in the world did I do so many stupid things when this is all I ever needed, right? Because in his presence is what? Fullness of joy. Amen. The fullness of joy. Because you and I were created to live in his presence. Yes. We were created to exist in that. And that is the atmosphere that God created us to be in. And so anything outside of that is emptying. It's, 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 it's nothing. But I can remember those early encounters with Jesus. I remember one time... I was walking out in our yard on a very clear night, and I remember being just stressed out about, about you know, going back to college and what I'm going to do and feeling like I'm not going to be able to accomplish the things because um, I just didn't have any confidence in myself. But I remember one night looking up, and the, and the Lord spoke to me, and he says, Chris, I want you to look at those stars up there. He said, not one stress of man has ever moved one out of its place. Wow. I said, my goodness, Lord. I look up at it all every now and then. I look up at the sky and I remember, I, I almost hear those words. I, it's always as though I can hear the Lord saying, have any of them moved yet? If they have, it's not because of my worries and my stressors. Mm. All right, but I'm going to tell you something. Um, God is in control. My brother Chris said he's in control. And how, I want to ask y'all a question this morning. How could Peter know that just that simple act of dropping those nets and following Jesus would lead 
to 3,000 people being saved, 5,000 people being saved, being a bishop of a church, being one of the, the, the leaders, being the, the rock that Jesus was going to, um, one of the rocks. Not that he built his church on Peter, but he, Peter was one of the rocks that Jesus used to start mm -hmm. this thing we know of as the church. Amen. Someone who failed him in his most needful hour, God would transform and he would use him. But Peter and his brother left the life they knew. Jesus is worth it this morning. And I, I believe there may be some in here this morning. You know that Jesus is worth following. You know that his presence is fullness of joy. But yet there's some things you're not willing to drop. There's some things you're not willing to leave in order to follow Jesus even though you know that he has a greater perfect purpose for your life. Some of you know that Christ is calling you to leave things that you really care deeply about. Some of you don't think your life could ever be used for something so great. But sitting before me today, I wonder, as I look out at congregations, I wonder how many missionaries mm. that are going to change this world for Jesus sit before me? How many powerful evangelists are sitting before me? Mm. Is the next Billy Graham, David Wilkerson, is the next mighty warrior for God sitting out here this morning. But you may think, how could God use this broken life? That's the only lives he uses. That's it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's it. Amen. It's the only, the only people he uses are those that realize they need him. Mm -hmm. I wonder, am I looking at the next Paul, Peter, maybe Martin Luther, maybe great um, brothers and sisters of faith that are going to change this world that are going to reform something for Jesus before he comes back. I wonder. But it all starts with one decision, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Follow Jesus. Amen. Follow Amen. him. I want to talk about another encounter this morning. Maybe one that's a little more dramatic. Mary Magdalene's encounter with Jesus. Mark 15, verse 9 through 11. How many of Mary Magdalene had some issues when she met Jesus? It says, now after he, and when Jesus had risen early the next day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, of whom he had cast out seven devils. And she went and told them that he that had been with him, his disciples, and they mourned and wept. This is obviously after his crucifixion. In verse 11, and they, when they heard that he was alive and that had been seen of her, they did not believe it. They believed it not. Y'all, Mary Magdalene had seven devils cast out of her. How many of you know that one doesn't get possessed with seven devils without being involved or being around some evil stuff? That's right. Amen. We don't know a lot about Mary Magdalene's history. Some have said she dabbled in the occult. She was a prostitute. I don't know very much about her life, but I know that when Jesus met her, she had seven devils living on the inside of her and operating on the inside of her. That tells us that she had a past that we know little of, but she certainly had a past. Because we know you don't get that wrapped up in evil without being involved in it and being around it. And I'm sure that when she set out as a young lady, a young girl on her life's journey, it wasn't her goal to become totally bound by the demonic. It wasn't her goal to end up in the lifestyle that she ended up in, bound and possessed by seven devils. Mm -hmm. I can tell you one is too many. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't her goal. And so maybe there's some here this morning, or online even, that say, Brother Chris, I did not plan on getting myself in the shape that I'm in. I didn't set out as a young child with the goal of being a drug addict. I didn't set out as a young child with the goal of being addicted to pornography or being in homosexuality or being uh, bound by lust or anger or, or fear or bitterness. But here I am. Can Jesus do anything with my life? Yes, he can. Some in here today you, or online, you didn't think you'd go as far as you went. I didn't think I'd ever go as far as I went. Maybe you found yourself in a place that you've lost total control. Maybe you have a child or a loved one that's lost total control. And you wonder, can Jesus do anything with me or them? Some fear what you may do next because you've lost control. How many of you know you can sense when you're in trouble? 
But sometimes you can't stop it because you're out of control. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus can change your life. You have a history that can't be changed, but you can be changed. Thank, aren't you glad God changes people? Yes. He deals with our past, but He revolutionizes our future. Yes. Thank God for it. This was true of Mary. I want you to think about this for a moment. Everything she had done from point A to Jesus left her in the condition that He found her in. But now, because He saved and delivered her from the demonic, Jesus to point B would be radically different. Mary Magdalene was delivered by Jesus when she had no power to deliver herself. This is, listen, I'm preaching this morning a gospel that has the power to forgive. Yes, it does. But we must also preach a gospel that has the power to deliver. When you're sharing Christ, you must share forgiveness, but you must also share the hope and the reality of deliverance. What, what Mary did, you see, is when she was delivered by Jesus, she followed him. She didn't go back to the things that trapped and controlled her, did she? But she followed Jesus in his life to his cross and to his tomb. Yes, amen. And folks, we've got to follow Jesus there too. Amen. We've got to follow him to the cross. Yes. Through the cross, to his tomb. And I want to tell you something. Some of you this morning here online have experienced Jesus. Maybe you've experienced the life-changing power of Jesus, but you didn't follow him. We all know people. We may have all been people that experienced deliverance. Mm -hmm. You experienced the real work of God in your life, but due to not following him, you went back into that bondage. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you this morning, Jesus can deliver you again. Yes. Thank amen. God for it. Amen. Jesus can deliver you again. He can deliver your loved one again. Today, you've got to understand that encountering Him is great, but following Him is the key. Yes. You remember what Jesus told His disciples? That if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and it will make you free. There has to be a continuance Amen. of our life in Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank God for the grace and the ability. She followed Jesus in His life. She followed Jesus to the cross. She followed him to the tomb. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Mary Magdalene was able to experience the risen Savior. Yes. This potential prostitute, this potential pagan worshiper that had seven devils cast out of her, and I want you all to hear me, she was the first person that could ever preach the resurrection from experience. Mm -hmm. God didn't use the leaders of Jerusalem. God didn't use the Sanhedrin. God didn't even use his own, Jesus didn't even use his own personal disciples Amen. to reveal himself to first. He revealed himself to a, a, a woman who already in this society would have been lower class, would have been a, no doubt had a reputation that wasn't flattering. But how many of you know the Lord is not a respecter of persons? That's right. Amen. All who are willing to follow Jesus can be used by Jesus. Yes. And you do not have to be the smartest and the best looking person. And I say praise the Lord Amen. for that. All right, I do personally. Thank God for it. But you just have to be a person that is willing to follow Jesus. And he will make of your life. He'll take you and he will cast seven devils out of someone and he will cause that person and he'll reveal himself to them first. That was not Jewish culture, by the way, for a woman to be involved in that and to be that to, for her to be in that position. Many people would have said it should have been a man, it should have been a man of, of authority and reputation. But Jesus chose Mary Magdalene. I want to look at Saul. Paul's encounter with Jesus. Aren't you glad that if there's hope for Peter, if there's hope for Mary Magdalene, there's hope for us. Amen. And I want to talk about probably even more of a radical, a radical encounter. Maybe, to my knowledge, maybe the most radical encounter with Jesus that ever took place. If you'll go, if you would like to, I'm going to be in Acts 26. And this is when Paul is um, talking to um, 
King Agrippa and his testimony was so powerful that he almost persuades the king to be a Christian mm -hmm. you know that's pretty that's pretty convincing how many of you know your testimony is powerful enough to persuade someone to be a Christian yes. Amen. but you have to tell it and you don't have to have had seven devils cast out of you. You don't have to have seen Jesus on the road to Damascus to have a powerful testimony. That's right. I think some of the most powerful testimonies are those where God saves a young child and keeps them from the evil of this world and they grow up and serve God their entire life. Yeah. I think that's one of the most powerful testimonies that a person could have. I think it's, it's, it's powerful, if not more powerful than anything, because where sin abounds, the grace of God much more abounds. Amen. And when you see a child that gives their heart to Jesus, because it, ta I mean, it, it takes some grace of God to keep a child on track, don't it? Yes, it does. I've been, Amen. been Amen. teaching a while. You know, just, <laughs> you know, I, I taught middle school, too, so it takes the grace of God, don't it? How many of y'all have middle schoolers? <laughs> All right, move along. Praise the Lord. Acts 26, verse 9 through 18. I'm going to read a few little bit of scripture here. This is Paul's testimony. I want to break this down, maybe speak of Paul a little more this morning. And Paul, he says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints that I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priest and when they were put to death I gave my voice against them. Let me stop there for just a moment. Paul is what we would consider today a terrorist. He had Christians put in prison and we know the very first martyr that's mentioned, the Stephen, Paul was the one that signed off on his death. He's the one that gave approval to that stoning. That's the apostle Paul a first century terrorist against the church of Jesus Christ. So if you think, well, um, Peter's radical, Mary Magdalene, that's radical, but I still don't know if God could do something with me. God can save a murderer and a terrorist and make them the greatest asset the church ever had. Amen. God can use your life if you'll follow him. In verse 11, it says, And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Damascus was in Syria. Paul's now leaving. He is persecuting the church beyond the boundaries of really, I think, the authority that he should have really had. He is moving beyond that. He says, I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, and at midday, O king, here's where everything changes. I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining around about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which I will appear unto thee, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you. To open their eyes. Here, why, why is God sending? And he's sending them, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And that they might receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. You see, Paul was trying to go beyond the borders of, of Jerusalem, beyond the Jewish borders to end Christianity, but God would send him beyond those borders to spread. Mm -hmm. This passion and this zeal that Paul had for destroying the church, God would sanctify his life and use that same passion and that same zeal to spread the gospel to the Gentile. And how uncommon would this be? Peter, 
Peter was described by the Jewish leaders as an unlearned man. Peter should have went to an unlearned people, but yet Peter stays in Jerusalem. Paul is a genius. Paul is a, uh, a student that sat at the feet of the greatest teacher, Gamaliel, that, that, that Jewish teacher that, that ever lived possibly, one of the most famous genius. Uh, Jew of Jew, Pharisee of Pharisee. Mm -hmm. But yet God sends him to the Gentiles that don't share his culture. Mm -hmm. And God gives him a heart for a people that he didn't relate to. Mm -hmm. Amen. How many of you know God God will take what you're good at and use it. God will take what you're not and he'll make you what you, you're not and he'll use you mm -hmm. if you'll just follow him. Mm -hmm. Saul again would be a first century terrorist against the church. He had Christians arrested but he consented also to their murders which made him a murderer himself. There was no bigger enemy of the church of Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul before he was the Apostle Paul. He was on his way to Damascus with permission to arrest and, and kill Christians. And I believe, according to how he described this, that as he was growing in his anger and hatred towards Christians, his goal was to do more and more harm against them because he couldn't stop or contain what Jesus was doing. Mm -hmm. And the only way in his mind he could think to contain it was to be more, more harsh and more violent against it. But he was stewing with anger and hatred for the church and Christ's followers. Saul's life was totally revolutionized by Jesus on the road to Damascus. When Jesus appeared to him, it wasn't haphazardly. Here's what Jesus said. He says, I have come that you might lead people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and that you might preach to them the forgiveness of their sins. This is ultimately why God leaves us here after we follow Him. He leaves us here for two main purposes. To make us like Jesus and to use us to reach people so that He can save them. It's so important to realize that every encounter with Jesus has purpose. Yes, amen. That's like Paul said, we behold. If you don't behold Him in His presence, you don't become like Him. But if you'll live your life in His presence, you will become like Him. And today... You know, in this place this morning, Jesus may not have split the sky open like he did on the road to Damascus. But maybe he's here encountering some people. He's touching your heart. He's moving upon your spirit. And you like Paul. You see, when Jesus says, is it not hard to kick against the pricks? You know, those were used to, to, to herd animals along. Mm -hmm. When they got out of line, you just, just stuck them keep, them, keep them going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it was a very painful thing if they got out of line. And God was asking Paul, is it not painful for you to keep kicking against the direction that I want you to go in? Mm -hmm. There's some people that are, that are painfully kicking against the pricks or the goads. The, 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 God's allowing painful things. And first of all, not following him just leads to painful things. For the wages of sin are death. It's not just not only God that causes these things, it's our own choices. Mm -hmm. But either way, God can use the pain to, to, to help guide people in the right direction. Paul was spending so much energy. And, and this was so, so real to Paul. He says, is it not hard for you to kick against the bricks? He said, Paul, you can't stop what I'm doing. You can't stop the church. That's empowered by my spirit. You can't stop what I'm doing on this earth. And I want to tell you this morning, individual here online, you can't. It's hard for you to kick against what God's doing. If God's doing something in your family, let Him work. Yeah. If God's doing something in your marriage, let Him work. Don't yeah. fight what God's doing. Yeah. If God's calling you to another country, if God's calling you to your community, don't kick against that. Yeah. Go with what the Spirit of God is calling you to do because it's a powerful thing if we will just follow His leading. Yes. But sometimes it can be a painful thing if we kick against it. And that's what Jesus was telling Paul. Is it not time, Paul, for you to stop kicking against the pricks and just follow the direction that I'm trying to point you in? And maybe today Jesus hasn't split the sky open. But maybe He has revealed Himself to your heart and mind today. Some in here are being called to surrender to Jesus. Some are being called to go farther in Christ. We all are. But you, like Paul, have been going in a direction that never seems to have a good ending. You make decisions knowing that the outcome will not be what you, is best for you or your family. 
Maybe you sense things pointing you in the direction of God, but you pushed in the opposite direction. You tried things your own way only to realize that you've gotten nowhere. This is where Paul was at. All of this learning, all of this you know, um, growing in the Jewish faith, being elevated in the ranks, all of this now has come to the point of, of nothing. Paul was trying to stop something that couldn't be stopped. Jesus turned the number one enemy of the church into the number one asset. Amen. Amen. He changed this change. Y'all, it was so radical that people were still afraid of Paul when they seen him, weren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, he go preaching about, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, may be, he may be coming at us at another angle here. He's going <laughs> to preach to us and then he's going to, you know, he's going to do what he wants because they didn't know what to think about the Apostle Paul. No. See, he was radically changed and they said, this man who once destroyed the faith He's now preaching the faith. And we don't know what to think about that. Yeah. All right, that, that's, that left a lot of people scratching their head in confusion. But let me tell you what. That testimony. And, and, and maybe God's doing things in your life and people are like, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. I can remember, I started preaching nine months after I got saved. Mm -hmm. And I can remember sitting now, I remember looking in congregations at people that they, I was probably the last person they expected to see behind the pulpit. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't, less than a year ago, weren't we? We were, but, but Jesus, but I met Jesus. Yeah. And you know what? Over these years, he has become the defining force of this life. There you go. There you go. You know, and, and those same people understand now that God has done a mighty work. Yes. And, and it brings hope to, to people to see what God has done in your life. But today, you can, God can make you a powerful testimony of his fulfilling love and grace, how he can fill empty hearts and empty lives. And, and sometimes he has to deal harshly with stubborn people. You don't have to raise your hand, but you might be like, Paul, you're pretty stubborn. And God, it took a lot. You may be here this morning or online, and you, you have been stubborn, or you are stubborn. And God's been trying to deal with you, and it's getting harsh, and it's getting rough. For 10 years, my wife and I have been praying for a situation. 10 years, we've been praying for an individual. For 10 years, we've been having to remind ourselves and God, Lord, we know that you haven't forgot our prayers. That's right. Let me tell you something. 10 years later, God's moving in mighty ways. Yes. I wish I could tell you things are changing. They're not all good. But you can tell God's in it. There you can go. tell God's in it. Um, so I want to encourage y'all. If you know somebody or you, you've been struggling a long time, or you know someone's been struggling a long time, just keep trusting God with your prayers. Keep trusting God with your faith. And God is faithful. I've talked to you this morning about three encounters. An encounter that Peter had with Jesus. An encounter that Mary Magdalene had with Jesus. I've talked to you about the encounter that Paul had. I want to say one more thing about Paul. You know, Saul was his Jewish name, and it meant one who inquires of God. It, it spoke of one that had, had authority. It spoke of one that had, had significance, as it were, in the religious realm. But Paul was his Greek name, or his Roman name. Paul meant little and weak. And is it any wonder why he began to go by his Roman name and not his Jewish name because Paul realized that all that he had done in himself as Saul was insufficient. And as we begin to realize that the power of the Christian life is not in what we can do, mm, there you go. but it's in what God does through what yes. we can do. Amen. Amen. It is as we're weak, he is strong. Yes. That's the power of the Christian life. Yes, yes we develop. I think I've developed as a preacher. I think I've developed as a teacher. But here's what I know. Yes, we develop our gifts. I thank God that's important that we do things with excellence and preparation. But it's also important that we realize that without God's grace, nothing of eternal consequence can happen. Amen. That's right. You know, and, and as we look at that, so you may have struggles this morning. You may have things in your life that you feel are disqualifying you from ministry. You feel they're disqualifying you from being used from God. And I'm going to tell you, your weaknesses, your infirmities, the things that you feel you're not able to do may be the very things that God is wanting to manifest himself through. 
just as he did these individuals that we're talking about. I think Peter Peter had sort of a cowardly streak about himself. I was I was I was listening to the book of I can't remember which but I listened to a lot of the letters Paul um, wrote yesterday. I can't remember now it slipped my mind. Do you remember Paul? Peter first of all denies Jesus to a young girl and three times he denies Jesus before his crucifixion. He gets filled with the Holy Spirit, but there came a point in, G in Peter's life when he was scared of the Jews again. Mm -hmm. Paul, it said Paul had to rebuke Peter to his face because Peter was living this way around the Gentiles, but then when the Jews came around, Peter was trying to live like a Jew and compel others to live like him. Mm -hmm. And Paul, Paul said, I confronted him to my face. And so I feel like the apostle Peter um, probably had a, he, he probably had a fear of man hmm. that he probably had to deal with most of his life, but through the grace of God, he was able to uh, overcome that when he needed to and be used mightily for God. I feel like Paul would have had a real self-sufficient attitude if, if he were left in himself. And you remember, because of all that he had accomplished, he was an educated man. He was a man of credential. He was a man of authority. Mm -hmm. Peter was none of that, but Paul was that. But what did, what did it say in, in 2 Corinthians, um, I believe it's chapter 10, that there was a thorn given to Paul. Chapter 12, that thorn was given to keep him from rising above measure, mm -hmm. to keep him humble because he did have heavenly visions. And I think Paul would have dealt with pride very strongly. I think Mary Magdalene would have dealt with just this feeling of unworthiness. Mm -hmm. Unworthiness to, to, to be the one to see my Savior risen. To be the one to proclaim He's alive. But let me tell you something. It is in weakness that we're strong. Mm -hmm. All He's looking for is a vessel. All He's looking for is a vessel. Let me, let's look in Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22. And I want to talk to you about what I consider the most tragic encounter that anybody ever had with Jesus. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22. And as you're doing that, I'm going to give you some water here. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22. Very, very uh, familiar passage for most of us. But this is the rich young ruler. How many know Jesus encountered him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He encountered Jesus. But in verse 17, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What shall I do? How can I earn it? But Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. And then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. It's important you hear that. He loved him. And he said unto him, One thing you lack, go your way and sell whatsoever you have, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. History has forgotten the rich young ruler. History has forgotten anyone that didn't follow Jesus. And one day history will totally forget. You know, if people are remembered, some people aren't remembered from following Jesus, but history has forgotten this young man because of his choice. Often I wonder what he would have accomplished had he been able to bring himself to full submission. Mm. But I was talking to someone last night and and we were just talking and he was, you know, sharing with me about how God's been dealing with his heart, but yet he felt that God loved him though. He felt like it was a father almost taking a son out behind the woodshed. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's important that we see before Jesus says what grieves this man, he loved him. Mm -hmm. He loved him before he told him the truth. Mm -hmm. 
And it's important for us to realize that when God deals with our heart, He does so because, He, first of all, He loves us. And He realizes that even though we may not follow Him, He loved us. And He had compassion. And I want to talk to you about a young man like Paul who was no doubt a man of authority, wealth, power. He, like all of us, was confronted with a decision to make. Jesus had exposed to this man the issue in his life that was keeping him from being right with God. You see, it was that one thing that was keeping him from eternal life. Some of you may be this morning. The Holy Spirit may be pointing out areas of your life that are not right with God. This doesn't please me. How many of you know the Lord speaks to us individually? That's the new covenant. That I will put in them a new heart. And I will write my laws upon their heart and on their mind. And you won't need anyone to teach you. What does that mean? You won't need anyone to tell you what God is trying to speak to you. Because if you're, if you're able to listen. If you have the ability to hear God, then he'll talk to you and he'll say, sell all that you have and come follow me. Man. All of us have been there. The Bible says that the word of God is like a spiritual mirror that we look into to examine the condition of our hearts and lives. When God reveals something to you that's wrong, we all have a decision to make. We can make things right or we can ignore what God is saying and walk away from the mirror and forget what God has shown us, y'all. I'm going to tell you what bothers me about this time period. I have this tendency as well because I am a human being. I have this tendency to be real serious about something for a while and then to just, then it, then it loses its, its, its ability to bother me and I begin to kind of revert back to the way I was thinking or living before that. I see that even with this COVID issue. I see that with some of the stuff going on in the world today. It's real easy for it to bother us when it first happens. It's real easy for it to be real for a moment. Mm -hmm. And then as we, we tend to do as human beings, we, 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 we either put our mind on something else or time gets in between us and that and we, it tends to lose its power or its influence in our lives. And we're that way as believers when the Spirit of God deals with us. This is why it's so important that we always live very close to God we live our lives in His presence so that there's a freshness about what He's yes. trying to tell us, yeah. that there's a newness about what He's trying to deal with us about because if we're not careful, we too, as this rich young ruler, can walk away from Jesus. And guess what? This man, as far as I know, lived the rest of his life probably as a very wealthy human being, but he did not go into eternal life according to what we know. And so... The Word of God tells us that it's like a mirror. The Bible is like a spiritual mirror that we look into and examine our hearts and lives. And when God reveals something that is wrong, we must understand, number one, that He loves us. Yes. Jesus looked down with love and yes. He says this one thing. Yes. Okay. So if God's dealing with you or me, just know that He's doing so in love. We can make things right or we can ignore what God's trying to show us and walk away from the mirror and forget what God has shown us. And some of us today are encountering God's spirit in this place. He's dealing with our hearts. He's dealing with our lives. And you know what you need to do. The question is, will you allow this encounter to be one of a life-altering consequence? Or like this young ruler, will we see for a moment the need in our life and walk away unchanged farther and farther from the presence of Jesus? What kind of encounter will you have this morning? In here and online, what kind of encounter will we have this morning? The Word of God tells us that 6,000 years ago, the first human beings created sinless sin against God. And as a result, all people are born separated from God in sin. 2,000 years ago, Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life as the Son of God and the Son of Man. Fully God, fully man. That God, the Word, became flesh to live a sinless life so that he could die in the place of sinners. God the Father and Creator can now forgive us through what his Son did. If the wages of sin were death, death was paid through his Son, so that now you and I can be forgiven from sin. So God looks at what Jesus did as enough to forgive the human race if they will but accept his Son and follow him. He was buried in a tomb, and three days later he rose from the dead, met Mary Magdalene, and... Fifty days later, he went back to heaven with his father. He then poured out his spirit 
And it is the same spirit that's in here this morning. It's the same spirit that is in this place and in many people's lives today. The spirit of God is who brings Jesus to you this morning. Jesus hasn't physically walked into this building today, but he has come by his spirit. Yes. And he is encountering you this morning. The word of God tells us that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that you and I could know him eternally and not perish in our sin. Why did Jesus come? God so loved the world, he sent Jesus so that Mary Magdalene didn't have to remain demon-possessed. Right. He sent Jesus so that Peter did not have to remain a Jesus-denying coward That's right. or an empty life that, that didn't accomplish the word of God. He, he, he sent Jesus so that Peter and Andrew could become fishers of men. Yeah. He sent Jesus so that the rich young ruler could discover the true meaning of life is yes. not found in wealth and riches. Yes. He has sent Jesus this morning so that you can know eternal life, so that you can know the fullness of life, so that you can know abundant life. And I want to encourage you all this morning that if you've not followed Jesus, I know he's calling out to you this morning. Yes. Follow me. Amen. And I will make you fishers of men. Amen. If you're here this morning and you say, I am following Jesus, but I don't know how he could ever use my life because of what I am or what I've done. I've given you examples today of how he could use the impossible and he could make it possible.